Hi guys, welcome to another video. Today we're going to talk about how the Federal Aviation Regulation is actually made. And joining me again today is Sarah. Sarah, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me again. And Sarah, as you know, if you've seen the other videos, she's an aviation attorney. She's also a professor at Embry-Riddle and she teaches uh, aviation law, amongst other things. And uh, she's going to join us today to explain kind of the complex process that we have to go through to get aviation regulation in the books. And the reason I'm talking about this and I wanted to go over the subject is because uh, we are going through the process right now with the Aviation uh, Reauthorization Act, the FAA Reauthorization Act, and uh, there's been some changes in the regulation. So I wanted to go over the process, explain how it works, and I brought the expert in with me, and she's going to help us understand and explain all the different steps. So let's get going. So you've probably heard these few terms, and I don't know if you are familiar exactly with them and exactly what they mean, but Reauthorization Act, and we're going to go over every single one of these. We'll talk about the USC, we'll talk about the FARs, the Federal Aviation Regulation. We'll talk about sections in general, and especially Section 349, which has been in the news. We'll talk about Part 107, and then we'll talk about what is an advisory circular. And then if you don't know the difference between law and rule, then Sarah is going to explain how that works and then what the difference is between the two. So how do we get started with this entire process? Who gets the idea that we need a new law? So um, essentially, either um, representatives or senators, if it's a House bill or a Senate bill, basically draft what they would like to see. And the way that this works is, if it, let's assume it originates in the House, the HR, whatever number, goes ahead and gets um, agreed upon and passes the House by a vote, and then it gets sent to the Senate. Now, if it starts in the Senate, then it gets sent to the House. And after that's done, usually um, people have issues and they go ahead and work through those in committees. Once that draft is a pretty much accepted by both the House and the Senate. It then goes across the president's desk and the president gets to sign it and when he does, then it becomes law. And that's how we got the FAA Reauthorization uh, Act um, of October 5th, 2018, last year. And so from here, we have the president signing it. It goes into law. So it goes into the books. What are the books? Where does it go into law? So essentially, usually um, there are different criteria. Some, in our case, the FAA Reauthorization Act, when it comes to drones, tells the FAA to go ahead and create some different laws, different CFRs rather. And so at that point, it's now in the hands of the FAA to come up with their process, which follows the Administrative Procedure Act, to bring those um, those laws into CFRs. And okay. so that's kind of where we're at right now. Yep, and we'll talk about that process in a second. So that act is going to be divided into different sections, and that's where you hear the term Section 349. In the past, you may have heard Section 333, which was a long time ago, and then Section 336. So step number one kind of goes through uh, the, the House of Representatives or the Senate, and then from here we get the, the president to sign it, and then we've got a law. So. The question was that I had in my head was, why do we need reauthorization? What is that term and what does that really mean in terms of the FAA? Well, essentially, they, they needed a budget for the next five years and they needed guidance as to what um, rules to make and um, where to go with. In this case, we're just talking about UAS um, in the airspace, but the FAA Reauthorization Act is way bigger than just UAS. Um, for example, this last act had um, rules for flight, um, for the crew, flight attendant crew rest. Um, they had rules for um, therapy and service animals on board and all kinds of stuff that is aviation related. But we're focusing on the sections that just pertain to UAS. And we had a couple that were very noticeable. Um, like the uh, Know Before You Go campaign um, that um, was funded $1 million per year for the next five years, and that was really good. And then we had one that's really um, we want to focus on is the um, flying um, property for compensation or hire using a drone, which obviously enables Amazon to deliver their goods. So we, we were told by Congress that the FAA had a year to put those rules into place, those CFRs, and that's exactly what the FAA is doing right now. And the um, the sections that we talk about, Section 349, I mean, I do a lot on the channel, but the uh, there is other sections that are related to drones that, uh, that I haven't discussed yet, but the FAA has been focusing on 349 recently. Sure. 
So from here, kind of step number two, we, we get the, 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 the rule, the regulation, or, or law, I should say, into the books and then uh, into the USC code. Uh, then, I'm sorry, into the USC, which is the US code. And then, like we said, the act mandates the federal agency, in this case, the FAA, to turn that into federal regulation eventually. And um, in this case, Congress for the Reauthorization Act for drone delivery, related to drone delivery, the FAA said you get 12 months to make it happen, basically. Correct. So the question may come, what's the difference between law and regulation? So law falls under the USC, the code, and then the regulation falls under the Code of Federal Regulation, the CFR. So what's the difference between the two? So when you have a US code, um, it's enforceable by the US attorney, and some of them are crimes. And if they're crimes, then the US prosecutor, the US attorney will prosecute that, and you will be imprisoned and or fined or both. Um, with a regulation, since it comes out of a federal agency, in this case the FAA, you essentially are just treated in a civil way, and I mean that not like a criminal way, but basically it just carries fines and or suspension or revocation of any airman certificates because that's the authority of the FAA. Now, I will tell you this. An action that you may do, for example, flying your UAS while intoxicated, um, the FAA gets wind of that and you get um, fined because you're flying an aircraft under the influence and that is a civil fine and of course if you have a 107 you might get that suspended or revoked. Now what the FAA does since they can't prosecute you for the DUI is they, they, they let local law enforcement know right away and then let's say the uh, City of Prescott Police Department will come to your door and basically handle it like they handle any other DUI. So one action could land you in civil problems with the FAA with fines and suspension or revocation of certificates at the same time with um, the prosecutor for the criminal DUI. And we have had a few of those in Arizona. Our local FISDO has done that and handed them over to local law enforcement for the prosecution. And so, yeah, so basically what it means is not because you're breaking a regulation doesn't mean you're only going to get out of it with just a fine. It could be breaking also a law, in which case you can get in a lot more trouble. So next step. Next step. Now we have all this stuff in the books and the FAA has got to go through the process of turning this into a federal regulation. So how does that work? We have to get public input, right? Yes. So um, according to our Administrative Procedure Act, federal reg federal um, agencies must go through a certain process before they make a CFR. And in this case, um, they will put out what's called an NPRM, which is a Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, and they place that document on a government website called the Federal Register. And they open it up for public comments. And every comment you put in there, you can, you can read the comments, they just add up for the entire time that the comment period is open, 60 days, 30 days, 11 days, whatever the FAA decides. Now, at the end of the comment period, when they close the comments, all those comments get read by up to four committees. And the, um, the way it works is this, they either have to take the input or say why they don't take the input. And if they take the input, they also say why they took it. So when the actual law, the final rule rather, comes out, you get this ginormous preamble ahead of it. Now, if you guys recall, when part 107 came out, part 107 has relatively few CFRs to it. However, the preamble explaining why they did what they did and addressing every comment was some 623 pages. So that's where lawyers like myself go because there's good information in there as to rationale, which will help understand the, the laws as the CFRs rather as they came out. And that's a really good document. And I'll put yeah. a link actually in the description for part 107. I actually found the one recently for section 336 yes. uh, for a video that I made um, about uh, the difference. If you could f fly, w when you should have a remote pilot certificate and when you shouldn't, basically trying to go over what is recreational. Yes. And, uh, and, I, and I went over this document. And so th this is a really good document to have. It talks about a lot more than just the law. And, and as you know, if you read the regs, the, the regulation, it's... Um, um, it's very open-ended in most cases and that because of 
so people like her can <laughs> make an argument <laughs> around it. But uh, the uh, the idea is this this document really helps you understand what the the spirit of the law, I should say, yes. uh, is and the and intent behind the intent. Yeah, and uh, and that's a that's a good document. So have. anyhow, when this final rule gets um, finished. Um, and agreed upon, then it gets placed back on that federal register, that government website, so we can all read it. And, it, and then there is a 90-day window to allow us to read it and understand it before it becomes law. So it becomes enforceable 90 days pretty much after being placed back on the federal register. So from here, we get federal regulation. CFRs. Yes. CFRs. So once it gets in there, then it goes into the, the, the CFR and the CFR, the Code of Federal Regulation, divided into different titles. And the title that we're interested in, in our case, is Title 14 uh, for the FAA. And, um, and then we'll find different parts. That's why we have Part 107 for remote pilots, Part 101, which doesn't exist anymore at this point, which we think is going to come back up. And then you've got Part 91, Part 61 for, uh, for men pilots. So there's different parts. Um, the question that I had in here, which I think some people get confused when this Reauthorization Act came out, was we used to have Section 336, which led to Part 101, which was the regulation for hobbyists. And then when the Reauthorization Act came out and Section 349 came out, 336 was repealed, Part 101 was repealed, and the FAA took a little bit of time to make this happen. Tell yes. us more. So the FAA cannot act immediately once the act goes into place, like it, in October. It takes time for the government to put the CFRs together, put the policy in place, etc. So that's why now you are seeing policy that looks just like part uh, section 349. You're seeing those eight criteria, for example, for hobbyists mimicking what was in the um, the law that went into place but the FAA gives guidance because by its own admission it hasn't had time to come up with a aeronautical knowledge and safety te test as of yet so and other things too so in the interim here's your policy to follow so that you can abide by this new law however that being said if you just shrug your shoulders and say, oh, it's just policy, I don't have to abide by it, the FAA could turn around and say, well, not really. There's part 107.23, 14 CFR 107.23, which makes you careless and reckless. So it's an easy way for the FAA using that catch-all phrase to say, well, we gave you the policy on best practice now, you didn't do it, so we're going to ding you on that. So you have to be careful about taking... Um, this policy that came out till we have a CFR um, and take it seriously. And it's still in the books as law under Absolutely. the U.S. Code. So Absolutely. You, you still have to abide by that. Now, uh, 107.23, careless and reckless. This is not something new to drones. This has been around under Part 91, which is operating rules for men aircraft. And there's the same exact uh, verbiage in there where you'll see careless and reckless operation. And that's kind of the catch-all. Yes. If, if you do something stupid, the FAA is going to get you and you're going to get dinged for uh, careless and reckless operation. So... Um, just just don't do stupid stuff. <laughs> so uh, the last thing I want to discuss is this term advisory circular. Uh, the advisory circular is a document that we've seen. There is one for drone pilots uh, for under part 107, which is 107-2. Um, and that comes up with a lot of guidance. And that's really what it is, right? The advisory circular it, it is a guidance. It is, Greg. It's guidance because the FARs are just a couple of sentences for each one and doesn't really go into much depth and there's multiple ways to interpret what was meant by those sentences. So the FAA puts together what we call advisory circulars to help better explain what they meant by that FAR, that CFR. So advisory circulars contain a real depth of information and knowledge and should be followed if you don't want to be careless and reckless. Um, and sometimes they have stuff in there like, for example, 107-2 has an entire appendix dealing with uh, risk management, which is the FAA's number one um, focus right now on all, these, um, on all these rules for UAS coming out with a lot of risk mitigation and, and risk analysis, hazard analysis, that kind of thing. So it's a really good idea to follow an advisory circular, even though it's not legally binding, it could be. If you don't abide by it and you act careless and recklessly, then Catch-22 will come back round.
Mm -hmm. And if you, if you file any waivers, then the risk management part that Sarah just mentioned, that's a big part of it, flying over people, flying at night. The FAA wants to see that you are actually uh, doing some kind of risk management and, and following all these ADM, uh, aeronautical decision-making process in order to get there. Now, advisory circulars can be, like you said, extremely big. If you are um, training for your part 107, or if you had your 107, you likely went into an advisory circular, the one about how to read aviation weather reports, for example. That's an advisory circular. Sure. Aviation weather services, aviation weather in itself. Those are two great documents that are advisory circulars. They're more like a book, quite frankly. They it's, are. Yeah, They're they tell you hundreds of pages. everything you need to know about the weather. So these are great documents. Um, I remember practicing for my CFI and you probably did the same thing and you download all these advisory circulars and you go through them. And they're all free, by the way. They're just um, large... PDF documents you can get straight off the FAA's website and you can actually print them yourself or you could pay to have them printed either way, but they're a really good resource. Absolutely. So if you have any questions, as always, please leave them in the comments. I know you guys are really liking these videos. They're getting a lot of positive comments, so we'll keep doing them. Uh, we'll keep finding topics that are interesting. If you have any ideas for topics, things that you don't understand that are not very clear, we'll be more than happy to go over them. And then I'll bring Sarah anytime that she wants to join us. Uh, she's a, a wealth of information. So thank you for joining us. I really appreciate You're that. You're welcome. And as always, please go ahead and subscribe to the channel so you can get notification. And uh, we're getting really close to 500 uh, subscribers, actually. So I'm really excited about that. So, Good Sarah, job, Greg. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Thanks. And uh, see you guys later.